This is unpleasant, and I apologize to everybody. It makes me want to uh, go back and watch an old Italian movie. Any a kung oh, fu film. Another Tony Robbins event just started. 14 hours later. Has Grant got his fingers on that? Pleasant, I apologize. Grant must be working. Learned something very important, Fenwick, watching YouTube last night. If you see mold on the, in your bread, you can't just cut it out. It's already across the entire piece. It's totally saturated. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. Did you really want to know that? <laughs> but you don't need to get penicillin shots. So I grew up I grew up cutting mold off bread when I was a little, little, and then I... Uh, that explains a lot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> then I had one bad bad exposure to moldy macaroni and cheese and now if i see even see mold i just throw everything away like anything that's even close i'm like i see something moldy let's throw this away and all the things that were sitting around it <laughs> it's the most expensive cheese ever to, yeah, honey pack the kids we have to move there's mold how in the you, kitchen how do you know if blue cheese goes bad <laughs> or limburger cheese charge you more <laughs> doesn't that argue that mold tastes good Have a great show, everybody.
Hi, everyone, and welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour, always a general discussion of production and IT-related topics where we answer audience-submitted questions. Second hour, typically a deeper dive into a topic. Today, we are going to be talking about frame rates. We'll look at a little tiny bit of history about where they came from, talk about what is the most common and how you can kind of deal with them as we go forward. So that should be a fun technical uh discussion. Remember to get your questions in. And if you have questions for the frame rate discussion, tag those so that we know that they're for our second hour. All right. With all that said, I believe Courtney is reading today. So Courtney, what's our first question? It's actually me. Wrong. It's Alex. <laughs> I'm taking over. Oh, it's Alex. Uh, first... Oops. I'm sorry. Uh, Courtney did the, the <laughs> mic yeah, yeah. check. So you I gotta, just thought. You got to look at the card though. You got to look at the card. Follow protocol. Oh, Come that's on. right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no. My bad. First, Alex, first question, take it away. <laughs> our first question is from John Folds in Sellins Grove, Pennsylvania. And John asks, does anyone know of a program for a Mac that can render HTML pages to a deck link similar to Casper CG for the PC? And Alex is going to give us a shot at this. Alex, you know, there's an app. There's an app out there that does that, and I couldn't find it before the show. Um, I'll tell you how I do it, which is that I... Uh, I don't use the the deck links. I use an HDMI output, and then I just convert it to SDI from there, and and I go full screen. <laughs> so it's the easiest way for me to do that full screen on a Mac um, to do you know to to put that out there. Uh, and I know that there probably is one. Ob um, OBS will do it. I'm just I just don't use it very often. But OBS has a kind of a screen capture uh, system. I will say I was just testing Memo Live, and I have to go back, get back to them that. Uh, I did it. I did it yesterday, actually, of capturing an HTML page and putting through Memo Live, and it came out a little soft, like it, just a little soft. So I'm not sure uh, what the processing is. It has the plugin to do it, but when I actually ran it through the system and looked at it at 1080p to 1080p, it was a little softer than the original. So, um, so I would probably look at at OBS or use the HDMI to SDI solution to to make that work. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Next question is from David Brady in uh, in New York, New York. And David asks, besides Companion and Isadora, what other desktop or mobile apps are, are folks using to manipulate Zoom OSC? Uh, trying to inspire the reluctant and looking for a low barrier of it to enlightenment that the layman can grok. Alex, can you begin our enlightenment? Yeah, I mean, I think that those are the two big ones. I mean, that, that, those, those are the ones there. Now, some people are building some more custom handlers, but I think that I think that Zoom OSC really is a a solution that I think Zoom ISO is a lot more approachable and has a lot of the or has all the OSC tools in it. But I think you know Zoom Zoom ISO. I think you open it up and you immediately understand what you can. Well, I don't know if you immediately understand what you can do, but it's pretty quick. If I can get all these, I can get all these um, video outputs, get all these audio outputs. Um, the Zoom OSC is probably a little bit deeper, and the the two places that I've seen it used the most is with uh, Companion or some version of Stream Deck, um, you know, and and as you know, of, of using it on the Stream Deck as well as uh, as well as Isadora. So I, I don't have another a deeper answer than that, other than those are probably the two biggest ones. And I would probably, if I was trying to talk to people about how cool the back end is, I'd be looking at talking about ISO. There you go. And of course, remember, we talk about this a good little bit. And some of the people who are involved in Zoom ISO come on the show occasionally. So keep your eyes on the future shows. And when Andy Carlocchio and the team and the other people from Zoom are on here, they will talk a lot about this. So that's a great source of information there. Let's go to the next question. Uh, next question is from, uh, sorry, I got a bunch of windows here. Uh, I'm in window land. All right. Next, 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 uh, next question is from Jack Cannon in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, thoughts on the Personas 1810C, considering it for use with bringing four XLRs into a Zoom production. It looks like Chris Fenwick has some experience with this. Chris? How do you know that? Because I was in the big box next to you. Anyway, so yeah, Jack, what you're probably looking at on this Personas is that you have four XLR inputs, which is cool. And I understand that that's what you're looking for. But... Um, Okay, hold on. Sorry, I'm in window land here. Let me move this around. Wait, that's not supposed to be there. That's weird. Okay, what you really want to see is when you when you select that item in today's day and age, we're we really want to see how we can get things in and out. In my opinion, through USB in an audio device. Yes, you got to get that XLR in, but then where is it going to go? So when I select my mix pre here, this is the audio 
MIDI um, setup tool. And you, you, you can see there's a bunch of devices here. So like, here's my Blackmagic design. It only has two outputs, but on my Mix Pre, I have eight outputs and four inputs. Now, I, I don't know why these are separate, but uh, why these are flip-flop, but these represent the outputs and these represent the inputs. And based on what you wanna do, I'm assuming that you're trying, because I know the project you're working on, uh, you're trying to get remote control of that stuff. So really, US, the way a device ties in via USB is probably more important than anything else. And um, we were working on John Preto's setup the other day with his Claret, and we assumed it had a whole bunch of you know uh, ins and outs, but in actuality, they were ADAT outputs and ADAT inputs. And I know that this Personas also, I think it works in the ADAT world, so you really have to look into it. I'm thinking that because of the name, the 1810, it represents like 18 inputs and 10 outputs or vice versa. But um, what you really care about is the USB ins and outs. There you go. Hopefully that helped. Let's go on to the next question. Next question is from Vincent Alvarez in Bellington, Washington. And Vincent asks, uh, need to get an extra HD for my M1 Apple laptop for when I dock at the office and just for time machine software, need two gigabit, gigabytes or bigger, uh, USB-C connection too. It will be connected to my 2B1 dock, uh, which allows me to use three additional monitors. And Courtney Gooden's going to help us out here. Courtney? I assume he means two terabytes because two gigabytes is pretty small for an external hard drive these days. <clears throat> um, I'd say the SanDisk or the um, has a, a wide variety of USB-C connected solid state drives is what I would go for for a two terabyte these days or a spinning drive if you don't have want to spend the money on an NVMe or a two terabyte SSD Um uh, Seagate or SanDisk uh, or Western Digital all make good ones. You can get them Costco, a lot of discount places, and that should work fine over USB-C for you. If, as long as you're using it for external storage and not as your operating system drive. And Time Machine as software is pretty automatic. It's built into the Mac OS, and as long as it can see the drive out there, you can specify that drive to be your Time Machine backup and determine how often you want it to write stuff to that to keep you safe. Let's go to the next question. Next question is from David Brady, and he asks, a Jargon Lexicon got uh, turned on to virtual production glossary. This is uh, vpglossary.com. Uh, might be a good resource for all. What are the panel's thoughts? Sky, have you checked this out? I have. I'm I'm in love with it for the reason that humans have to agree on a certain term or word in order to, and we've already discussed, we use different terms in, in different parts of the world for the exact same thing. So to have a centralized, curated location of a term in our vertical industry, I love this because the differentiation for me, the jargon is kind of anecdotal, but lexicon is words that are used in a specific uh, industry. And for instance, today I looked up frame rate and somebody curated the frame rate at which sequences of images are captured or displayed. The frame rate is usually measured in frames per second or FPS. See this very nice and succinct, but then the multitude of detail that goes on beside it is, is fantastic. Now, again, we're, we're hearing chat GBT is going to start giving us answers, but this is again curated, feels like people that have been using these terms inside the virtual production glossary. I think I like it. This is interesting. I wonder what they're going to do when two different cultures use two different terms of the same thing. For example, director of photography in America and lighting cameraman in Great Britain. It'll be interesting to see what they do with that. Alex, you had some thoughts? Yeah, I think it, it looks great. Um, it looks like a great place to just go, what, is, what does that term actually mean? And how does that actually, you know, and, and just to kind of throw it in there. So it, it does look very curated and very well done. I will say we were talking before the show, I think Sky pointed to it, is that a lot of times when I'm asking, when I'm thinking about something now, I'm opening up chat GPT and asking it a question, asking it some more questions, asking it some more questions, getting my head around it, and then I go Google. <laughs> and then I dig into it to kind of cross check all of those things to make sure that some of them are there. I will say that chat GPT-4 has been barely off at all. Um, you know, the chat GPT-3 was kind of like a, you know, 
drunken uncle. <laughs> you know, sometimes it was right and sometimes it wasn't, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it seems like he, he's gotten off the bottle uh, for the uh, when, when he got to G, 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 GPT-4. So I think that um, I think more and more of us are going to be asking things where it explains it. Now, if it doesn't get it right, a lot of us are going to be wrong. But um, And I'm not using it as the – I use very, very few times do I use uh, – any one point of view as the source. So I'm always looking at something and then I use it to gather the vocabulary by which I will now use to Google. And so, and then I'll look at a bunch of different things. So when I'm researching something, I want five, six, seven, eight different views of the same thing, as opposed to I'm just gonna read one article and decide that's the truth. Uh, and I find that where they all agree is pretty close to the truth and where they don't agree is pretty much their opinion. I wrote down uh, drunken uncle because <laughs> I'm going to use that as a simile in the future. I like that. Courtney Gooden. Yeah, I was looking through it. I, it I'd like to see more acronyms uh, displayed in there. It does show some acronyms after the uh, the things. I was looking for, you know, you see in, in titles all the time in British films, HOD, which is head of department. I don't see that in there. HODs. All those HODs got left out. It is about streaming. It's about streaming. Yeah, it's virtual production. Only about streaming. Yeah. Virtual, virtual oh, production. new school. Yeah, <laughs> there you yeah, go. Exactly. All right, let's go to the next question. The next question is uh, from Isaac Lay in Dayton, Ohio. And Isaac asks, is anyone using global cash in production? And if so, how are you testing it without connecting physical hardware uh, in a pinch? I have not heard of this term, but uh, it's interesting. It's on my radar now. Uh, so... Alex, I think, is going to help us a little bit, Alex. Yeah, this is, so what, what this does, and I haven't used it in production yet, but Global Cash, what it does is it allows you to send, uh, basically you can take, I think it's IR and all, IP and lots of other things, and send those close, and close, uh, uh, um, closures, uh, contact closures. You can send all of those things over the Internet. And that is a really powerful tool as you start to build some of these virtual events. Uh, it's something that I think Guy Cochran has used in the past or, or has talked about in the past. And it's something that every time someone brings it up, I'm like, oh, I got to, I got to buy a set of those and test them, um, because it, it it would solve a bunch of other problems that we've had in the past. Um, and so it's it looks really impressive. Uh, I think that you would to test it, you need to put things t together that use it, and that's probably why I haven't done it yet. <laughs> this is we you should buy a set of it. Is it a two part hardware solution? I believe it is. Well, you can you can actually have it just be IP out to it, um, but it's so you can you can just send con commands to it and have it do the things it needs to do. And we've had lots of need for this uh, in the past, and uh, haven't had anything. You know, we've built versions of this with Arduinos and all kinds of other things, but this looks like a much more managed and much easier to turn on solution. All right, let's go to the next question. Next question is from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. And, Mos and Roscoe asks, here is a group that could really be helped by office hours. And he, he gives us a, a, a link here. It happened, I happened to meet an attending school while flying to California yesterday. Has anyone heard of them? Hmm, Sky, do you have some insight? I researched this, the website that, that Roscoe, and Roscoe as an educator in this industry, we're talking about the verticals of video production or film production specifically is, is his history in Lo Southern California, where that's a, a legitimate job that you, you, a career. And so I'm looking at all of these different topics. A lot of people seem to be from the East Coast. Uh, as their their resource and again from around the world they've got television and film they've got a great marketing uh, somebody really knows their marketing but I would assume that each of the different people uh, that are speaking have their own experiences that they're bringing so I'm not quite sure what Roscoe is hoping that we can help them with but maybe it is uh, the the live production concept they just have the content and they need to and want to get it out but they've got great marketing yeah, their website, stnconvention.com, Friday workshop session. So it looks like they hold some sort of training things. And yeah, I was just seeing up on screen some, oh, I know Ken Stone and some of these. If, no, that's probably not the Ken Stone I know. That doesn't look like him. So anyway, it's always good to pursue additional education because we're in an industry that changes so fast, getting the latest and greatest. I mean, what you knew five years ago can sometimes be woefully out of date. So years. interesting. Years, years. Yes. That's, that's a lifetime. <laughs> that's true. What you learned, what you wow. learned last Thursday, could be out of date the way this industry works. Let's move on to the next question. 
Next question is from Andy Kokendorfer in Vienna, Florida. And Andy asks, has anyone on the panel used IBL? Uh, here are some free ebooks on image-based lighting. Alex? Yeah, I have. <laughs> so, so anyway, so what you want to, uh, image-based lighting is basically using images that you shoot on set to relight CG objects that are going to be put back in, they'll typically put back into that set. So um, a lot of times what we do is we, we get probes and there's a couple different ways of doing it. Sometimes you see that, uh, you'll see a, a mirrored ball swinging over to, a, to, a, uh, to a, a, a gray ball and that's them grabbing the data. And the advantage of using that ball, it may seem old fashioned to use something that's physical, but what it does is it measures what the scene looks like. And it because of the way reflections work, it actually gives you a mirrored ball that's half open because of the angle of reflections actually gets you about 270 degrees of, of the coverage of the set from that mirrored ball. And what it does is it shows you how that camera, whether it's a digital camera or film camera, is respond the lighting and color and everything else is responding to that so that when you take that later and use it as, uh, you know, a source for your lighting, uh, you can, it's, it's properly uh, colored in the way that it should be. Now, a lot of times people do other things. Um, it can be as simple as taking, uh, we, a lot of times we've taken little thetas and we take those thetas and we put them on a tripod and, and you can run, you can basically shoot true HDR. So when you think about HDR, a lot of times when we think about it in stills, we think about it as as producing um, an image that is uh, tone mapped so that it all feels like it's together. But you can also shoot all those stills and build this HDR image that basically maps all of that lighting over a very, very large number of stops. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll have it, we'll have the, there's a, some programs that'll talk to the Theta, they'll talk to Canon cameras, they'll talk to a lot of other things and say, take, the, take this exposure nine times uh, at two stops apart. And now you're building this huge, you know, 20 some, 30 some spot, um, stop image. And what that does is that if you bring that back into a computer program, it can build the lighting back because it knows where the really, really bright things are compared to the, the, thing, the, the things that aren't as bright. And you can't tell that from an eight bit image or, or even a 12 bit image. You want a much louder, you know, 14 stops isn't that much when you're trying to describe light. So having these higher dynamic range images are really useful. You can also use um, tools that will do it automatically. You just set it down and it just starts shooting all the way around and it will do, it'll capture everything. It just depends on how much time you have on set to do it. Uh, we are going to be talking about that more later this year um, around capturing those images, but we've been, uh, uh, I've been doing these kinds of things for about 20 years. So it's not, it's not a brand new thing. Um, but it is uh, becoming more and more popular. And Alex mentioned the Theta, and I just happen to have one within arm's reach. So this is the little unit. It's an inexpensive 360-degree camera. You can push the button on the side, it'll take a photo, or you can do video. And essentially, just in one click, get everything 360 degrees around you. Real simple, real easy, and real convenient. Next question. Uh, next question is from Tlaloc Lopez-Waterman in Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas. And Tlaloc asks... Is it possible to change the sample rate on a, a bird dog 4K quad or is it locked to 48K? Alex? I think it's, uh, I, I, by sample rate, I'm not 100% sure. I think you're, what you're asking for is, does it, can it do multiple frame rates, I think? And the answer is yes. It can absolutely do uh, frame rates from 24 up to 60, I believe. And so um, if, if that's what you're, if, if by sample rate you're talking about that, uh, then yes, yeah, twelve k inputs is what it's capable of, but it can it can shift up and down uh, on those inputs as well. Let's go to the next question. I think. Oh, I'm sorry, Javier Alfaro had raised his hand in on that. So yes. Javier. Yeah, sorry, I wondered the same thing at Alex, but I think Tlaloc is referring to some audio sampler rate, like forty eight k instead of forty four point one, and the audio specs only say forty eight kilohertz. It doesn't can switch like different interfaces, so. If you're working, wondering about that, uh, the spec sheets only say 48 kilohertz. That's that's probably a bit more more accurate. I didn't quite quite understand what that what that looked like because four times 12k is 48k as well. So or you know so it's or 48g I guess is what I was looking at. Um, I think I think Javier is probably ac accurate there. The I would recommend never varying from 48k for audio on a video signal. That's it will create a lot of sadness. 
Yes, I am facing that right now because 99.999% of the work I've done in the last five years has been 48 kilohertz. And I just happen to have a client now who works in the audiobook field and they're at 44.1. And every time I reset something, I get scared that I'm going to forget and leave it there. If, if someone says me, all sorts of problems, if someone says me 44 one, I just convert it to 48. I just keep working and then I put it back. And then I, if they need it back at 44 one, I'll give it back to them that way. But I don't change any of my pipelines away because I, to your point, I've accidentally left it in, in that state <laughs> and then you're, you know, so, so I, I just run it through a conversion immediately because it's not, life's too short. Yeah. We did. That's the funny thing about standards. There are all sorts of them. Let's move on to the next question. Next question is from Adrian Allback, um, and Adrian asks, can a Behringer Wing console uh, act as a controller for the XR18? If so, how far apart can they be maximum distance UTP cable? Alex, do you work, is it UTP? I, yeah, I, guess yeah, it is. I, I wouldn't do that. Um, so I, I, I guess the thing is, is that what would be, I think that the X-Touch would work with the XR18, but the Wing, I don't know... Um, I guess my my only the wing is a big it's a big console to control a little XR18, um, and really what the the Behringer design for controlling the the mixers is is the X touches. So if if I was looking at something, I wouldn't be trying to con I, a wing is something that I would run a show with, but a wing is not something that I would try to control an XR18 with. I think that I would be using a uh, looking at the X touch series is really what you want to be looking at, and in that series, it's just Ethernet connection, so you should be able to do it. I've never tried to use an X touch with a I've always used an iPad with the XR18, so I've never used an X Touch. I mean, the X Touches we've used a lot with the X uh, X32s and M32s, but not not with the not with the uh, uh, the the XR18. It's I think it's really designed to be used uh, with an iPad, but it, I think it can be used with the X Touch. Adrian, I hope that helped you. Uh, and for all the rest of you, don't forget, every day we do this, and your questions are what drives the entire show. So if you have additional questions, be sure to put them into the Makana interface, and always vote them up and down. The highest voted questions are the ones we get to first. We spend the most time with them if uh, we have the expertise on the panel to be able to illuminate the subject. So your voting is critically important. So I always want to make sure that you're actively participating in that. Thanks. Let's go on to the next question. Next question is from T Tobias Moss in Minneapolis. And Tobias asks, interviewing head of production, streaming and video editing applicants for my synagogue today. What questions do you recommend? Any other advice? P.S. I know Alex would say to work with them on a project basis before going, going there. Well, Tobias, you're in luck because two of our longtime production people, Chris and Sky, will help us. Chris, take it away. Yeah, I agree with uh, uh, Tobias's comment that Alex, you know, yeah, work with people because you're going to have to work with them all the time. You know, in the 80s and early 90s, people would send you a demo reel. They'd send you samples of their work on a bad VHS tape. Uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, I would always just say to people, send me a link to your work because pre- YouTube, you had to know how to take your video and put it online in a way that looked good. And if you couldn't do that, I really didn't want to talk to you. Um, past that, uh, in the YouTube era, I just, I want to look at somebody's YouTube channel. Show me the work you've done. Now, that doesn't show you how working with them is. And that goes to the comment about, you know, work with them on a project basis. But I just want to see somebody's YouTube channel before I think about hiring them. Sky, I, I doubt if you're going to do a Myers Briggs test or one of these personality cons, you know, uh, quizzes, but maybe ask: Are you? Do you feel that you're an introvert or an extrovert? Do you understand that as head of production, you're a servant leader that you might be helping uh, in a live stream coordinate and organize other volunteers, especially if they're in a paid position. As a as an editor, uh, again, the understanding that you are possibly going to be sitting in a dark room living other people's lives. Are you okay with that? Because uh, I know case studies or, or testimonials or even from memorials, these are, these are things that I'm seeing a lot of video production happening in, in houses of worship. So those are, those are some thoughts because uh, live streaming is a different animal than editing. And if that person uh, understands technologically the cameras, that's one thing, but the storytelling 
of your people's story is also their responsibility. So how can they help organize, coordinate, and, and move your people forward? Alex, your thoughts? Yeah, I'd ask them to tell me stories about production. Like, tell me the hardest job you've done or the job that you're most proud of. Uh, the job where something went horribly wrong and what did you, you know, how did you handle that? Uh, the job that didn't work ever. Like, it just failed. Like, and, and, and why did it fail? And what could you have done that would have fixed it? You know, and, and then I'd ask, you know, what are you good at? What are you not good at? You know, those are the kind of things that you want to know whether people, people who can't say what they're not good at aren't, uh, you, you shouldn't hire. <laughs> Like, you know, like, you know, like you shouldn't, you know, like that, that's a, that, that's like, and what do you, what do you want? Like, why are you here? Like, why, like, why do you want to be this, this job, you know, and have them, but have them explain those kinds of things. Uh, and, and really look for personal accountability. That's the thing that is probably the hardest thing is when people say, you know, in, in Pixel Core, we had, a, you know, I had 40 employees and, and when something went wrong, generally there were a lot of people saying, I could have done this, I could have done this, I could have done this, because that's the kind of people we hired and that's the culture we built with people blaming, <laughs> blaming themselves, not other people. And that starts at the very top of everyone going, I could have done this and I should have done this. And, and, uh, and, but we all looked at how we could individually do that and as a group improve. And uh, there are people who will very quickly start telling you why it didn't work and externalize that. And if people externalize why things don't work, then uh, they'll have a lot of trouble with production. John Preto. I would ask him what his disaster recovery plans look like. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. And we're going to finish up with Chris Fenwick. So, Alex, I completely misunderstood the client's um, needs. I built a completely uh, wrong show. Nothing worked properly. It went down in flames horribly and I got fired. So I was hoping, could you give me a job? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's always hope for an employee who will say that though, as opposed to, no, I didn't do anything wrong. It's but not I think, me. I think uh, it's you, them. If, if, those if people. Ask, a, a lot of it is if you if ask people. says that, he's not getting hired, period. No, if he says that, but, but I think that if you talk about the best show and the things you're most proud of, and then the, you give them opportunities to talk, you give, when you want to give people an opportunity to talk about the things that really worked and what worked about it, um, you know, what they, what they think is great production. Give us, give me examples of productions that you think look really good that you're, that you aspire to those kinds of things. Yeah. And, and there's no such thing as a free horse. So even if Chris does it for free. All right, let's go to the next question. Next question is from John Preto in Las Vegas. And John uh, says, Mid Journey 5 has arrived. I'm proud to report the following. John, give us a rundown. What do you think? Sky and I were on the live launch party yesterday with David, uh, the CEO, that interestingly enough calls their weekly show office hours. We're very pleased to announce that finger rendering has been decreased from seven down to 5.2. <laughs> it's probably going to be hard to get. Ooh, to, I want to see the point two. Seven, yeah. yeah. <laughs> finger rendering is way better than it used to be. Jeffrey actually posted a very interesting one with a bunch of people with their hands in the middle of like a go team thing. And it came out pretty good. I, get a, I did a guy with a guitar with six fingers. I'm like, wow, that'd be really handy to have another finger to play guitar. <laughs> Um, they've the increased cord. <laughs> they've increased the 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 realistic rendering of of the images. The images uh, are are going to be rendered out at a higher resolution than before. The upscaling right now does not work. So if you up try to upscale one image, it gives you the original image back. So that's broken. Um, a bunch. Of, what they do say here, which I want to, which I wanted to cover, was. Make sure that your prompts are longer than shorter. Um, so they've, they've made it actually harder to use than, than the previous version. So read the release notes on five, but yeah, it, it's looking really, really good. So people are expected now to change their prompt strategies and write more rather than less, give more, 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 arti more articulate than prior. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Sky. Well, and that's where I'm using chat GBT to create my, my prompts now. And consequently, they are finding certain keywords that are uh, like imaginative. All of a sudden, for some reason, the, the mid journey really likes that word. And they were launching it at the same time as they uh, opened the doors and we, we broke it. So 
2,700 people around the world decided to jump on it as soon as David released it. And consequently, it failed within about 20 minutes. It overprocessed. I mean, it, it overtook the, the processing, but they were we were just streaming visual images that people from around the world were testing new, some of their original prompts. And it, it again, watching mid, the mid journey experiment go from 2 million to 13 million in under a month of, of people participating in, the, in this exercise. That's a part of my uh, observation of community building and imagination it freeing with with people around the world now people are scared of that but it's still a fascinating experiment to watch i think in the reddit communities that's called the hug of death everybody liked this so much that they crashed the website and everything else because there's just too much interest uh courtney did they describe uh, john what caused the multi-finger problem and how they conquered that problem was it confusion over the number of fingers on a hand if you include Dave. the thumb Dave said specifically, somebody asked him about fingers. He said, hey, six months ago, we didn't even have faces. So there you go. <laughs> so they're just working fast, I guess. All right, cool. Good answers and good discussion. Everybody's interested in this. Next question. Uh, next question is from is also about uh, Mid Journey. Uh, this is from Craig McFarland, and Craig says yesterday Mid Journey released access to version five of their AI image generator, improving things like hands. Uh, and he said, uh, what are our thoughts? Well, I think we just went through them. Sky has an addition. Sky faces also. They were one was uh, doing a thing with a screen, and he was very excited. What was interesting is they had about eight of their developers on this office hours testing it in real time, and they were being very excited about what they were observing in the moment. And they said faces, eyeballs uh, are looking like eyeballs rather than just slits with you know globes behind them. Interesting. Alex? Yeah, I was going to try to show real quickly here. Um, a, uh, um, I did just do a test render. And, and what you have to do, by the way, when you do mid-journey is you need, to, um, you need to go in and hit slash settings. And then you'll get an interface of all the things that you can turn on inside of it if, you're in the, if you have your own account or whatever. And, it, and then once you do that, you just say you click on version 5 instead of version 4. And here's, I'd done a whole bunch, I don't know if I, I think I'd mentioned that uh, I did a, um, I did a, all my Christmas cards this year were with Santa Claus doing something that would relate to what my different family members do. You know, so my father's a lawyer, so Santa Claus being a judge and my, my mom's from Arizona, Santa Claus riding, a, 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 you know, a, what turned out as a wagon in the desert in Arizona. And, uh, and so there was all these things that I did and the number one thing that I dealt with was fingers. Like it was just eight fingers. It was multiple layers of fingers. It was all these things that were fingers, fingers, fingers. <laughs> so I asked, I, as we were doing this, I asked Chat GPT, or not Chat GPT, Mid Journey. Uh, I said, give me um, Santa Claus holding his hands up, <laughs> holding his hands up to the, uh, you know, to the camera. Oh dear. And uh, this is what I got. Five fingers looking everywhere, like normal looking, normal looking uh, hands. So that, that's fresh off the presses then done a minute ago uh, with it. I, I'm sure we could probably do the same thing with version four and then we would just get the garbly gook that we had before. Uh, but uh, anyway, I think that it's, uh, it's it, that will fix a lot of things for a lot of people. I'm super excited about it. That new AI yeah. smell. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> that upper right picture looked like can, uh, Santa selling timeshares. I liked it a lot. <laughs> this, this one. Anyway. <laughs> the, yeah, the, uh, yeah, you, you, yes, you. <laughs> <laughs> Close now. Exactly. <laughs> and we'll throw in. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to the next question. Next question is uh, from Scott Havler, uh, Halver, I'm sorry, Halver in Winston-Salem, New, New, uh, North Carolina. And, and uh, Scott asks, we do some one-man band filming in central London. Is a Rode Wireless Go kit a usable solution for taping occasional Vox Pop interviews? I know it auto-manages interference any real world experience, uh, we're re replacing an old Sennheiser kit. Let's start with Javier Afaro. Javier? 
I really like Rode as a brand, and even though I know it's not top notch for uh, wireless mics, I, I'm pretty sure your budget won't fit Electro. So if you're uh, replacing a Sennheiser, it can really be a good op option. I would just, I mean, interference may not be that hard because if you're a one man band, you're probably going to be close to your talent uh, and your camera. But uh, I will go with the Rode Wireless. I think that the, the two, the Wireless Go 2 has internal recording. So that will take care of any interference because maybe you can hear interference in your headphones, but uh, it's, the, the recording is going to be clean. So it's not like the top level, but to one man band the thing, I think it's great. Chris Fenwick. Uh, Scott, I wouldn't go so far as to recommend it, but I will tell you that uh, a few months ago, I went to the SEMA car show with Keenan, and we had, <clears throat> excuse me, we had one, we used it. Worst case scenario, uh, being in a big trade show, uh, we were in a couple of halls where we used it. And I gotta say, it worked pretty good. Uh, I was, I was surprised for something that essentially, I mean, it's nearly disposable if something breaks on it. Uh, it's, it, I was, I was shocked. Uh, so real world example, pretty impressive. Courtney Gooden. As long as, uh, I haven't used the road go, but I do have the DJI mic, which uses a similar 2.4 gigahertz type of, uh, communications. And as long as you're okay with seeing the unit itself hanging on the front of somebody, uh, it works fine. Remember, line of sight is your key here. If you're not line of sight, you're going to have problems. Uh, so don't put it behind somebody with an external lavalier plugged into it. Um, and uh, <clears throat> having the transmitter with a person's body in between the transmitter and the receiver is going to be problematic. A hand mic wired into your camera is always the best way to go on on uh, interviews, but uh, you know it could work in a, even in a crowded situation, especially if you're outdoors. It should work fine. Alex, yeah, and once once you're out of the United States, remember that you can buy. It's easier to buy transmitters that are that can both record as well as transmit, and so you may want to think about that as well. Uh, so I think Deity has them. Of course, the Sound Devices has the A20. Uh, I think De Deity has a less expensive version of that, and both of them will record locally on the transmitter as well. And the the A20s on the United States can't do that because of some licensing issues, uh, so you can't do that in the United States. But um, in the rest of the world, you can uh, you can set those up. Uh, it, it really depends on how important it is, how important that audio is. Uh, most of these uh, smaller transmitters, like the Rode Go, the D DJI, all of those are. They're great on a sunny day. It's just that it does get a little harder when you start, you know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with them. And having that be your only transmitter, I think, is is a little bit challenging. So I would recommend if I was on the street and if I'm not doing live, if I'm doing live, it's one thing, but it sounds like you're doing filming. If I was doing filming, I would always be using something that can record locally, whether it's Zaxcom or Deity or um, or the sound devices, so that you you have a copy of that. Even if it breaks up, you can use that broken up transmission back to your camera as a sync track, bring it back in, replace it, and it'll all be great. And Courtney has another thought. Yeah, I was just going to mention that the DJI does record. Uh, oh, has locals record well. inside and use that. They're available internationally, including the United States, with that enabled. That's great. And Fenwick has a last. And Scott, I put a I put a link in the in the uh, event chat with a, a video that uses the thing at the convention center. Like I said, I was, I was impressed. Yeah. I think when uh, my feeling about those small units is when they work, they can work really well <laughs> when they don't work, they stop working entirely. And so there's the risk factor. If it's for something casually you're doing for yourself, I can't think of any reason not to give it a shot. Uh, but, but, if you're getting paid for the gig, just be sure you're careful about how you use it. Yeah, the, the, the real Jonathan. challenge is always that you, you, you have success with something that you know, on a sunny day and then you start scaling up and you start telling people you can do more, more and more and more. And then you get into important events and then things don't work anymore um, because they get more complicated. And so you don't want to overspend, but the, the inexpensive way to do this, whether it's the DJI or Deity or, you know, are, is to get something that's going to record on the person's body. If you're not doing it live, that will totally work, but do not... If you're doing filming, you always want to try to be recording locally to the person if you're in an open environment. You just don't have enough control over the environment to make that, to, to know that that's going to work. And you may spend 
you know, half an hour with, with a talent sitting there waiting for you while you're trying to figure out why you're getting just some noise or you're going to spend hours and hours and hours trying to clean that noise later. Yeah, and make sure you've got a monitoring loop so that somebody is listening to it. And if you're getting any problems, you identify that quickly and can redo something in the field. Sky, you had a last thought before we move on? Yeah, I looked up Vox Pop on our uh, virtual production glossary. It said, sorry, we don't have it. So I looked up Google and it says, it's the voice of the people. I learned new stuff today. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Yes, Vox Populi, the old Latin. All right, let's go to the next question. Next question is from Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. And Paul asks, yesterday at South by Southwest, Abby Lopez and I teamed up for a, some uh, for some video interviews at the Creative Industries Expo. Do you think this is a good name for a global media conference? Courtney Gooden. Uh, creative Industries is includes a whole lot of things. It could include, you know, jewelry makers to artists to sculptors to you know, other than just people in the media business. So I, it may be a little too broad a name for uh, uh, for an expo uh, because creative industries could incorporate, you know, thousands of different, uh, you know, types of, of art. Or, but if they uh, showed both cameras and interpretive dance, it could be fun. Sky, yes. you had a thought? I, I love it. And because I come from television and film and both of those technologies are no longer just distributed through one medium, uh, one delivery device. So I, I think creative is a is a great word. Industry means you're moving forward in, in purpose exposition or expo to, to show something that is creative. And I think South by Southwest is the perfect place to, again, create new lexicon, new words for us to uh, em embrace the future of technology and, and communication with one another. Let's move on to the next question. Next question is from Douglas Carmichael, and Douglas asks, I'm testing Parsec with my 2017 MacBook Pro as client and a 2023 M2 Mac Pro Mac Mini as host, and I'm blown away by the performance versus the Mac OS screen sharing. Would there be any Parsec-like remote access tools uh, to have iOS, PadOS client support? And nobody, ha oh, there, Alex is going to help us with this. I don't think there is actually. I, I think that the issue you, you get into there is that it, there's just a lot of sandboxing, a lot of uh, things that are that are there within the iOS platform that would make this much harder. There you go. Next question, please. Next question is from Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas, and Paul asks, "Do you run BitFocus?" companion natively requires Stream Deck software to be closed, or do you use Stream Deck software via the companion plugin and why? I think we've had some discussion of that on the show. Alex, what were the results? Timing was bad because I think the person that would answer this is Chris, and Chris just had to go. <laughs> so so he, had, he yeah. just dropped out. So uh, maybe ask that question again, uh, you know, when we have some folks that are heavier into the companion. Maybe Fridays are usually oftentimes where we have more people that are using companions to try it on Friday. Perfect. Uh, next question. Next question is from Rick Holmes in Columbia, Tennessee. And Rick, Rick asks, I have a shotgun, a Rode shotgun mic that I would like to hook up into my iPhone. What connector do I need for this work, for this to work? So there are some interface boxes that you can plug in, uh, depending on whether you're lightning in or 3.5 millimeter in on your phone. Uh, there are units from a company called Ceramonic that do this. They provide little XLRs with phantom power. You can get a mono or even a two channel one and they feed your phone via lightning. Uh, Alex, do you have other thoughts? Yeah, I use the uh, I use the Ceramonic ones, the Ceramonic interfaces, and so those all have XLR with forty eight volt. They they have their own battery. They plug into a light the lightning port, and we've used them with both shotguns as well as labs. So we'll have like a setup like an, that we have the camera, and you'll see me. I'll be showing some of this as we get ready to NAB because I'm going to be using one for that. And we'll have a we have the camera, we have the Ceramonic underneath it. They're all attached to a larger piece there. That has it, and sometimes I'm even using electrosonics, you know, to to go back to that and then feeding into them. But the the shotgun will work as well. Absolutely. Next question. Next question is from Douglas Carmichael, and Douglas uh, asks: Would driving USB C monitors through a hub from an M2 Pro Max MacBook Pro cause any performance issues versus driving them directly? Courtney. 
I don't think so because the monitor goes over a different connection than the uh, data over the USB-C uh, ports or lightning ports. So I don't think you should have any problem uh, with you know content, data contention on that. Alex, you have a thought? Yeah, I'd really recommend using a Thunderbolt uh, uh, cable. If you're using a Thunderbolt capable machine, use a Thunderbolt cable and a Thunderbolt hub. The bandwidth on the Thunderbolt is much higher than USB-C. <laughs> so, so I would, uh, and it's, it's going to definitely give you a better chance of having that work. Yeah, that we're in the world of the, they use the same connector on USB-C and Thunderbolt and Thunderbolt 2. And, and it, it gets to be a little iffy when you plug a cape in, cable in to, that you can't be exactly sure what the rating of that cable was. So I agree with Alex. If you buy the good ones at the top end of things, they're compatible with almost everything in a reverse direction. So you almost always have a cable that's just going to work, which is the goal. Next question. Next question is from Junior Grant in Bronx, New York. And Junior asks, good day, everyone. A house of worship is planning to invest in an M2 Mac Mini Pro for streaming and recording audio at the same time with Ableton Live. Is the base M2 Mac Mini Pro sufficient as a long-term investment? If not, what is your best recommendation? Alex? It would be close. I, I don't think you have enough RAM. So I think that you may want to think about getting something. If you're going to do a long-term investment, um, I would think about at least 16 gigs. And I might think about doing the Mac Mini Pro as opposed to the base Mac Mini. So it's going to be cost you a little bit more money. Um, but if you're trying to run two things at the same time on there and do one, you're starting to add too many things. The, the base unit is only $599 and it, it is limited to what it can do there. So I would think about the Mac Mini Pro. Uh, and maybe even if I'm doing long term, I, I will say that you're going to be better off if you can. I know I'm saying it's a lot more money, but uh, but potentially using something like something bigger, uh, like a uh, like a studio. But the other thing to think about also is two Mac Minis. Uh, two Mac, two 16 gig Mac Minis are going to run you about fifteen hundred bucks, and they're going to give you in do one thing on on one computer, another on another. And the reason that you kind of want to split those up, oftentimes also, is because of people. You may want to have two different, one person working on Ableton Live, the other person doing the streaming and separating out those responsibilities are easier with two, two machines. Um, you probably could run each one of those machines on a Mac mini base, but I would probably think about the 16 gigs. It's about $200 more per unit and it'll make a big difference in the headroom that you have as you're starting to do streaming and audio. Next question. Next question is from Douglas Carmichael and Douglas asks, in a NASA press release, they said that nearly a megawatt of energy was used for acoustic tests on the Orion capsule. Would any studio facility in our industry have that much power, one to two megawatts uh, or more, available for productions? And could 3210 do that? That's, for that's me, interesting. <laughs> I did one gig once upon a time, a long time ago, where they actually had to string cables from one place to another to add more power in. Uh, often good electricians can help you do that. But Courtney, what are your experiences? Well, if this is acoustic testing and they're talking about one to two megawatts of acoustical power, you would deafen an audience. So I don't think any studio facility would ever uh, need that much uh, power uh, to pour into speakers or an acoustic environment. I think they do that testing because the sound coming off of the uh, launch vehicle at launch is so loud and they have to spray water, of course, to dampen the, acoustic, the, the sound coming out of that thing that they have to test if the vibration, the acoustical vibration in the acoustical area will, you know, disconnect things inside the capsule by vibration. So I'm not sure what they're using, but uh, it does take a lot of power and you would not want to, to you know, s submit an audience to a couple of megawatts of power. That's not good. Alex? Yeah, um, so... I, I believe, if I'm correct, um, 3210, the stage that used to be the ILM stage that's in the building that we're in, uh, has about has the capacity of about 1.3 megawatts. So it, it is, uh, when you think about watts there, it's, it's, it's a lot. It, that's 6,000 amps, it's 2,000 amps th three leg. So it's 6,000 amps uh, times the 220. And so, the, um, so I think that it would be about uh, 1.3 um, megawatts to, to do that. And it is not enough to run a full space like you see in Mandalorian. <laughs> so, so just, you know, when you think about that power, uh, uh, you know, the, the so it, it is, you need more like uh, two to three 
uh, megawatts to to run one of those screens. So it's it's a uh, it, those things definitely happen in production. So it turns out all those little tiny LEDs suck up a lot of <laughs> juice. Is that what you're telling me? It's real warm, real quick. <laughs> so you're, you're yeah you have one of the biggest space heaters on the planet at that point. Let's move on to the next question. Next question is from Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. And Paul asks, just for a couple of days, Sure has a discount on their mics with a checkout code S, uh, at, uh, South by Southwest or SXSW Sure 2023. Will you get one of their new multicolored MV7s? Ooh, Alex, have you seen the multicolored no. MV7? No, I will not. <laughs> the proper color for a microphone is black. Black, I tell you. You know, <laughs> I will not. I will not be buying a pink a pink microphone. I'm or or an orange microphone or a blue microphone. The, the problem. What if with, they do Paisley? If they do <laughs> yeah, Paisley. Um, they the problem with the 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 Shure microphones in in general is that that not the problem, but the problem with colors. Is that it really backs you into a into a corner? You now built bought one for this look, and now you have a whole bunch of other looks. And also, usually, we want the microphones to be kind of in the background. So, a dark gray, uh, possibly a silver. I don't even like silver ones. I don't like anything bright. I want that that microphone to kind of just be there. Um, so, so I, I I I prefer things that are a little bit darker and more muted. So, I I don't think that I'm going to be doing buying any colored mics. Uh, you know, I think that there are YouTubers out there that'll think that's great, and they will um, have them with their their little light in the background and all that stuff. Uh, the So one thing that I, I can't believe someone hasn't done, I shouldn't say this because I was going to turn it into, I, I was like, I could turn this into a business. The Shures, uh, the, the MV7s um, are, there's a couple problems with them. One is that they scratch really easily. So if you pack that around anything else, it'll just start scratching. Now it can be fixed for camera with very careful application of a Sharpie. <laughs> I have found you go up and down on it. You get rid of the stress. You can't see it on the camera. You can see it if you look up really close. You can see the grain, but otherwise, so you can fix it a little bit there. But the other thing is got this huge Sure logo on the side, which just feels like you're doing an ad. Every time you do a show, you're doing an ad for Sure. And so it becomes a little a, a pain. What, I, what I've what i been thinking about right now is to build a cup like thing that pops onto the back of it that's like rubberized, but has your own logo on it on the side and everything else. I think if you just made a custom, you could build a custom thing where you just put these on the, you know, and they're like a wrap that, that would slide up on the back of that. And, um, and it Alex's would be, be mic livery. It's be yeah, brilliant. Exactly. I think it'd be good. <laughs> then, then you could, then you yeah. could, it'd be like a, it'd be like a, um, a flag that you would normally put under your thing, but on your, see, Sky's already thinking about it. He's looking at it. He's thinking, he's thinking about it. I see that. Thinking, From the what, early what, days what, what when color? I was on set. My my mother in law could knit a scarf, then it would go with my outfit. <laughs> oh, microphone cozies! That would be <laughs> my, <laughs> it's my, your my business. That, why, why didn't we think of a microphone cozy? All right, well, if, we, if we had names for shows, if we had like funny names for shows like Twit, we would call this show the microphone cozy. <laughs> <laughs> the cozy hour. I want a, anyway, I want a, I want a percentage. Yeah, and, and, but if, having if, done if you, video if you have for a microphone, <laughs> if you have a microphone cozy, you, you're going to have to have it. You're going to have to talk the whole time, like. Hi, how's it going? How are you doing? <laughs> We're just gonna talk about gonna talk about audio today. In yeah. NPR at its finest. <laughs> yeah. We'll Cozy chat. Audio. Yeah. Anyway, I, that's one of the reasons though, having been in video most of my career, I like the dark things because if there's anything reflective on set, anything behind the line of cameras, mm -hmm. if it's brighter, will get reflected easier. So if you got a tight shot of somebody and you're going, what's that orange thing? And you look behind you and somebody has some orange big drink cup and you're going, take that off the set. I don't like that. Uh, so just part of the process that we go through. Next question. Next question is from Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. And Paul asks, uh, there's a new AI kid in town, Ernie Bot from China. A registration starts today. Will you sign up? It's from the search engine giant Baidu. Uh, John Preto, how do you feel about Chinese bots? Ba Baidu. It's uh, no, uh, the answer is no, I'm not going to sign up. They, their stock got clobbered after they made their announcement, their little demo yesterday. And uh, first of all, Paul, just be very, very careful. All of the AIs right now are recording everything that you put in them. And so do you want China knowing more information about you? I say no. Sky Gleason. I, I don't think I'm lazy. It's just I'm overwhelmed. And I, I did sign up for Bing and trying to become a part of that channel. But there everybody's offering this new new tool. 
And I'm I'm going to kind of stick right now with MidJourney just to learn the language because it's evolving by the minute, as we talked about earlier. And um, there's a couple of other platforms uh, that are uh, I'm, I'm just trying to learn the tools that are currently being offered. So I'm going to wait on that one. Alex. Yeah. When hell freezes over. I mean, like, you know, like there's no way I would, there's no way I would sign up for a Chinese uh, AI thing. That's just insane. Like it's an insane idea that they would even put it out there and expect us to sign up for it. Nobody should be doing that. I have to admit that I, I, I watch a lot. I used to watch a lot of TikTok. I watch a lot less because they made it longer and it had nothing to do with my concerns about TikTok. I, I didn't really get riled up about it until there's this filter that lets you, I don't know, unless the moons of people who are dating or married or whatever. And I thought, oh, that'd be kind of funny to do with my wife and to see what, see what it looked like. And I, I went to it and it said, can you install an app? And this was from ByteDance. And then it says, uh, give us full access to all the images on your phone. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, like, you don't even need any images from me to do this. And you're asking for all of my images and it won't start if you don't, it won't do anything. And the fact that it was, I'm holding this hostage of, I want, you have something you want to do. And I'm, I want all the images on your phone. I suddenly felt like I saw what China was doing and immediately it was like, they should ban TikTok. Like I, you know, like I, I went from, oh, I don't know. It's that, you know, and I think even just the damage that TikTok does by making a hundred million people less effective. I mean, that's cost like, it's like, I, I did the math. That's like $4 billion of damage a day of having people waste their time on that app, on that platform. So, so I think that of just doing silliness, I think that's the biggest joke is that, that China is already costing us, you know, trillion dollars a year of lost productivity on that app. So, um, but, but the fact that they were asking for it, I was like, they are, this is definitely a mining mission. Like as soon as that, as soon as that app came out, I was like, TikTok is a mining issue, a mining mission, they should block it. Like we should, I, yeah, that's my opinion. Let's go to the next question. Uh, next question is from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. Are there places that you would visit if you were trying to learn certain technologies or would you consider the internet to be sufficient or even superior to master almost anything? Or would you visit a mentor over a location? Courtney, give us a start out. Uh, I would start with Wikipedia because Wikipedia has articles on almost every kind of technological device made or, or subject made. And once you look at that broad, you know, broad coverage and read the Wikipedia article completely, then start searching in YouTube because that you'll find more people doing explainers on the most esoteric types of equipment out there that even if you were to uh, work as an uh, apprentice to a, you know, world famous sound mixer or something, you know, you'd be, you'd learn some, may pick up some tips but I find that a lot of people that are working professionally in the industry may not have as much knowledge as, as is available out there about the equipment they're using. I've worked with, early on in my career, I worked with sound mixers who didn't understand how the equipment they were using worked. Uh, but they were able to use it and work in their own specific way. But if something went wrong, they wouldn't have any clue how to fix it. Uh, so, you know, it depends on the person that you apprentice with. Uh, or you observe working because uh, there you're only as good as that person's knowledge. So I would try and expand my own knowledge first before trying to pick up some tips and tricks from those that are working in the field. Alex, can you do it in 30 seconds? No, but I'm not going to try. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, so the, uh, uh, the, the, the thing that I would say is that you need to, um, uh, Sorry, I got thrown off by that. that was not a, um, no, let's go to Sky. No, 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 no. You can come back. So the, the, thing that, the thing that I would say is that what, what we're experimenting with here, what we're doing here in office hours is designed around how do we provide something that's wide open that people can, that people can ask questions um, and uh, that you can constantly be doing. Kind of what Courtney's talking about is that you can play with ideas. You can play with things and always have somewhere to ask questions of, folks that hopefully know a little bit more than you do um, on those things, or at least can can kind of keep guiding you in the right direction. Um, and so so that is the, you know, that's what you want to think about there as far as um, uh, how that looks. Now, we've done a lot of training where we do skills. The thing is, is that you have to have the technology to go back and forth. And so Google Glass was great for a little while for us because you could see the what the person was seeing on their in their eyes. And there's other companies now that do that. And Google Glass still exists. 
But those those point to points where I see what you're looking at and you see what I'm looking at, and I can say we were able to teach people how to use a camera from 8,000 miles away by saying, okay, push this button here. And they go, this button? And we had the same camera in two different places. And we're like, no, 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 this button. And it was, in some ways, it was almost better because other people could sit there and watch us as we kind of went through that that piece there. There are definitely things that having someone there and having access to the equipment is is important. So I don't think you can do everything remotely, but I think you can do a lot. Sky? Historically, we had to go to the location because that was the barrier to entry. You had to have that certain piece of piece of equipment or the area, Detroit, for instance, was the location that you made automobiles and then all of the other ancillary uh, companies that made the parts for those automobiles. So you ended up in Michigan. But once that got decentralized and again, since the, the question and again, I love Roscoe's asking the question because he is an educator in the education experience. But specifically asking about technologies, and as we were just talking about, we're mining knowledge. We're we're knowledge workers now. So now the access or the barrier to entry is, yeah, who knows something that you want to understand? And will they give you access to their knowledge? And so I don't know as I need to go to Detroit right now for learning knowledge. Now, there's all other other kinds of reasons why I love California, but it's a factory town. It, I was told early days, it cranked out video sausages. And I thought, wow, that's really crude. And then I realized as after several years of making a living at it, the, the first term was the velvet handcuffs because you get locked into making that product and that's how you make a living and support your family. So there are lots of ways to learn things. And I think technology is allowing us to learn globally and faster than we've ever been able to as a species. Uh, and Courtney wanted to get in on this. Yeah, I was going to say the uh, learning technically to use a piece of hardware or a, a piece of software um, may be one thing, but um, the social skills involved in production are not going to be taught to you by the people that are on YouTube. You can learn technically how to use something and master a piece of hardware, software, but learning how to use those skills in a social environment in a, on a production team, you're going to have to learn that by apprenticing. And you may not, you know, if you go into a situation, you may know all the hardware perfectly, but you may not uh, know how to stay in your lane once you get into a, a production. So that's an important part of mentoring. Okay, well done. That takes us to the top of the hour, which means we are going to be turning our attention to our second hour question for today. And today we're going to be talking about frame rates. And I did a little bit of research and I had a, just a couple of quick little things that I wanted to do kind of to frame this discussion. It's not going to take very long, but there's this guy. Uh, this guy maybe has something to do with frame rates, and this is a guy named Leland Stanford. He was the California governor and a bit of a horse racing enthusiast back in the day. And legend says he got caught up in an argument about whether horses that were racing ever had four feet off the ground, four hooves off the ground, at the same time. So interestingly enough, he hired this guy who is named Edward Muybridge, who was an early photographer and experimenter. And he set up a bunch of cameras with a tripwire and sent a jockey down the track and caught something that looked like this. And surprise, surprise, when they developed everything and he got all the photos back, the photo in the upper left second position showed the horse with all four hooves off the ground. And that settled the bet for everybody. So... In a real way, um, it basically invented this idea of moving pictures, or at least that's the, the apocryphal story. No one knows if it's absolutely accurate that way. So I suppose you could argue that that was actually the beginning of the film industry and movies and TV and office hours. So we're going to be talking today about the evolution of frame rates. Um, back in the early days from my research to getting ready for today, hand crank cameras, which were the earliest movie cameras, were pretty variable. They ran because you were just physically hand cranking it anywhere from 14 to about 20 frames per second. Silent movies finally settled on 16 frames per second, but when sound hit film, of course, they needed uh, a slightly better sound uh, standard because the 16 frame stuff didn't sound good. 
So they moved it up to 24 frames per second, which is where the movie industry still is to to this day. In the 1950s, 30 frames per second became the standard for analog TV broadcasts, at least in North and South America and Japan. That is related to our 60 hertz power supply, because 30 frames per second is an even divisible of that. Europe adopted 25 frames per second, since they have a 50 hertz electrical system in a lot of areas, uh, which gave us our NTSC standard of 30 frames per second, CCAM, and in Russia, Eastern Europe kind of adopted sort of the same thing as PAL with a 25 frame per second second thing. And that brings us to a discussion of how do you decide what is the right frame rates? And it is really a soup out there now. These old standards are being kind of challenged as we are no longer in the same distribution systems that we used to be. So when you're thinking about cameras and things like that, one of the things you have to do is as you increase frame rates, you also traditionally need to increase the amount of light falling on a scene if you want to get the same exposure. And there's a couple of things that kind of fall into this frame rate, shutter speed, how many how much duration is the camera lens going to be open to capture light? And there's even shutter angle, which has to do with circular uh, rotating shutters that would work at a fixed speed, but you can let more light in by having more of the gate open, more light coming in over the course of time. Um, so shutter speed, how long the aperture is allowed to stay open. Um, shutter angle, so that rotating disc and how much of the light allows to pass through and shutter speed um, all go together to determine whether or not your frame rate is going to get you good exposure. So common, we have 24 frames per second in movies, streaming, video games, and that's kind of attached to what people call the classic cinematic look. 30 frames per second, that's typically live TV broadcasts and most TV shows. In sports and things like that, it's kind of nice because having those little, uh, having the extra frames gives a little extra clarity to action, which can be useful. 60 frame per second is pretty common these days too. As 4K gets most more common, that kind of increases the smoothness of action and it's great for video games and things like that. And then you get into the high speed camera stuff where they're pushing frame rate uh, 120 frames per second and above. We have special effects, things like the phantom cameras you see a lot on YouTube that get super slow motion. Those are used for special effects and analyzing motion and action and things like that. But they do require a lot of light to operate. Okay, so that's the overview of everything. Now we're going to kind of go around and talk to other people in the panel about how they feel about the frame rate things. Alex, you want to start us off? Yeah, and, and we deal with a lot of different frame rates. Back in the day, we used to be dealing with, uh, we used to have, uh, or we used to think about a lot, uh, the frame rates that that were related to 15 frames a second, 10 frames a second. Like There's lots of things that we tried to slow down when we were watching little postage stamps and when we were figuring out what is the minimum. In fact, one of the things that that um, they did in the 90s in, in at a location that they were, there was a, it was an event location. And one of the things that they started to experiment with is how low a frame rate can you go before it disorients someone. So one of the things you have to think about with frame rate is is what you the the version of what you see. And this is a really important part of frame rate. What you see and your inner ear and how they're connected to each other. So when your inner what you're what you're in, experiencing with your eyes doesn't match what your inner ear tells you, um, it. It, what that meant for a couple million years for a human being is that you ate something bad and you should get rid of it. <laughs> so when you when people get sick uh, really, really quickly and it's physical, like you cannot do it at a certain frame rate and it turns now people are more or less sensitive to it. So the, if I remember correctly, the research that was done at this facility found that if someone had, you know, there are certain kinds of people, you know, pilots and so on and so forth that could handle a lot of that. You could get down to 12, 13 frames a second. There are some people that became sensitive at 18 frames a second. Um, so there were there were these frame rates that, and this is people putting goggles on and looking around. And so the frame rate, what frame rate means, means a lot based on whether you have a point of reference, uh, whether you have film, whether you have, whether you're doing VR. So for film, um, you are, you really, you know, there's a, an accepted frame rate, which is 24 frames a second. That's what most films, um, uh, most films and most quote unquote, filmmakers, <laughs> you know, whether, whether they're corporate or not, shoot at is 24 frames a second. Um, and it's kind of considered the film look. Uh, and that was based on, you know, how little can we spend on celluloid in 1922? Like, you know, like that, I mean, largely we were just people trying to save money was, you know, what's the minimum, there was a lot of frame rates at the very beginning. 
of 15 and 17 and 18 and there was hand cranking so it was going up and down and moving around and finally that that became uh, standardized I think in the early 20s a hundred years ago um, to save money. <laughs> so, so, so that was the, you know, and so then we built, uh, you know, we built our whole system around that and people have a certain look to it. I, it's actually pretty useful as a frame rate because uh, it constantly tells you it's not real. So it, it actually makes it easier for people to handle certain things and, and look at them. And they're used to that, that very framey, framey look um, that, that, that 24 comes, you know, uh, comes out with. As we started to move forward, when we see more frames, oftentimes perceptually, we are, um, when we see more frames, we feel differently. So film has a certain feel to it. As the frame rate increases, it becomes more visceral. It becomes more, you feel more connected to it at oftentimes. It's not like you're watching something happening, you're more in it. And so we, we start to, we're starting to see more and more high, what we call high frame rate HFR. Um, I don't usually, some people call 60 frames a second HFR, but I would call it 95 frames and above is uh, 96 frames because of the multipliers. Anyway, so, but 96 frames and above is what, what a lot of people, a lot of us talk about frame rate, um, high frame rate. And the reason for that is that somewhere between 92 and 96 frames a second, we find that the brain stops thinking about it as frames and start video and starts thinking about it as reality. And so when you get into that upper area, you end up in, in this 96 to two, 120. Over 120, it gets to be just logistically, the, the return of investment is very low. There are people who are working on 240 frame, 480 frame solutions. Um, but for the most part, those aren't necessary for playing something back in real time. Of course, you can go up to 10,000 frames a second or even 100,000 frames a second to capture slow motion. But, but as far as playing it back, um, in frame rate, that's frame capture. This is frame rate that we're playing it back at. What we find is that 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 120 becomes a really good format for things that are live. Uh, you know, if we can get to it. And right now, there's almost no pack, no nothing that's doing that. <laughs> you know, that's that that's outputting those things. But we find that that high frame rate is when we see the tests of those. It's very very compelling. Um, so and the nice thing about 120, by the way, as we talk about frame rates, is that it's evenly divisible by many other frame rates that we use. So 120 is divisible by um, 60, by 30, and by 24. So what you're able to do, and this gets back to what Bill was talking about, is that the, it may have a certain motion blur, but you can actually recreate that motion blur using um, uh, a variety of, of um, optical flow technologies to put that motion blur back in from all the extra frames that you're not using. So 24 has two frames on either side that it can that it's not using, that it can be used to rebuild that motion blur. Um, and what we find is that we have to um, do a little bit of work on it. It's You have to shoot with a, a wider, a, a, an open, more open shutter uh, at 120 frames per second, and it still looks a little framey. Um, so we shoot at actually 360 degrees, and that allows us to do those conversions. It also makes it look a lot smoother. And Sky has some thoughts, Sky. I was in Los Angeles working in the television industry and 5994 was the the standard there. Then I moved up here to Seattle and we were working with a lot of different independent uh, camera people that wanted to make art. And so we would get a lot of 24 or 2398. And consequently, when they would pan across something, they didn't have as many frames or they would whip the camera and you would jerk, 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 jerk. And that's why when when Alex talks about 120 frames now, it's just so smooth. And the other insight I had would be working with uh, when ESPN decided on a certain manufacturer because it had a higher, had the high fr frame rate, but it also they went with a progressive versus interlaced experience. And that's where if you want to get really nerdy, well, drop frame versus non-drop. I frame versus P frame. And that's why Courtney's here. He's going to help us understand. Thanks, Courtney. <laughs> Courtney, let, dive in. Let me serve up a wonderful repast of a can of worms for you. Uh, it happened, you know, persistence of vision is the thing that Alex was talking about, where, where they determined that the frame rate where your brain would meld a series of stills into a single moving image. Uh, is caused by your your the, your the light falling in your retina and your brain interpreting each one of those images. No, so when they started uh, the frame rates for television to be at thirty based on the AC you know frequency rate in the United States and fifty for Europe, um, that was great. Those are integer numbers. Then color came along, 
That was black and white television. Then color came along and opened up a huge can of worms because they couldn't fit the color signal into the same amount of time space uh, uh, for the 30th of a second for the frame, frame rate for television. So they decided to take some time away from that frame and make the frame rate 29.97, 0.1% slower. Uh, so Amer that was in TSC color. And that's what caused all the confusion for the next 20, 25 years, 30 years. Uh, that time base of 29.97 based on 59.94 cycles per second as the uh, time base for the television signal instead of 60. And so that difference causes timing differences. If you've tied a clock to that rate, the clock would be, you know, 60 seconds per, I mean, 60 minutes per hour, 60 seconds per minute. Uh, that all works. But when you go to 59.94 as your time base, time doesn't, the clock doesn't count the same anymore. So time, when time code came along to keep as a method of keeping synchronization between different cameras and different audio and video, uh, it became a huge problem because you're transferring 24 frames per second into 59.94 time base or 29.97 frames per second. Uh, it doesn't go evenly. And they had to come up with this crazy thing called three, two pull down so that uh, each frame of film would be up for three, three fields, then two fields and three fields and two fields to uh, get get it to divide evenly into the 59.94. And that difference uh, we've had to deal with, that created a huge number of time, time code frame rates, which is why you'll see, you know, when you go to set the, when you're doing a production, they say, what frame rate are you shooting at? Well, integer frame rates, 24, 30, 60, no, or 29.97, 59.94, you know. It, uh, it makes a big difference. And if you don't set the time code at the correct rate, uh, the time will drift. And they'll drift off at 0.1% uh, as you go, and it'll be cumulative. So the time code, we match up at the beginning of the shot, but it'll be out by the end of the shot. So that created a huge nightmare in uh, the conversion of film into video uh, for years and years. Then the when we transitioned to digital cameras, they decided to choose the standard frame rate to be based on that NTSC rate of 59.94, which is how they, the division came out to be 23.976 or 23.98.98 instead of 24 for digital camera capture. So we've stayed with that non-integer frame rate for digital camera capture uh, in the industry for all high def uh, capture for quite a while now. But some people still insist on shooting 24. So that conversion has to be made. It's called pull up and pull down. And it is the nightmare of any sound mixer or post-production editor uh, when trying to deal with, you know, what frame rate to set their project at, what frame rate was the stuff shot at? Was it shot at 24 integer or non-integer in Europe? They have it a lot better because they never had non-integer. They'd have to deal with NTSC color. They had PAL color. They hadn't didn't have to deal with the non-integer frame rates. Everything was evenly divisible. They didn't have to deal with slowing things up or speeding, you know, pulling things down or pulling things up in speed when they go from one media to the other. So that's kind of an overview of the can of worms that is non-editor frame rates. Thank you, Courtney. I could have never done that. But and the, just the, to add one more little, oh, the, the punchline punch was know what your deliverable is, because that's what really all it comes down to. What does that network want? Do they want 24? Probably not. Film do. Universal will. Sony does. But uh, TV wants 59.94 or 29.97. So. Yeah. And, and sometimes the client doesn't know. And that becomes an even more neurally problem when the client looks at you on set and says, I don't know, what do you, what do you want to set it at? And you're trying to make a good decision. Uh, one more little codicil, because Sky mentioned it, drop frame. Uh, 
drop frame is the worst name thing in the whole industry because you never drop frames. It's technologically impossible to drop frames. You just drop frame numbers and you do that to coordinate long stretches of footage so that this mismatch in time always ends up at the top of the hour correctly. So it is a process of dropping frame numbers, not dropping frames. Alex, you had a last thought? Yeah, the um, it is to get back to what Sky was talking about. The one thing you should take away from this hour, if you take anything away, is how important it is to discuss what the frame rate is, and then how important it is for everyone to do it. Uh, it is very hard to fix later. If you have a one thing to note, for instance, if you're live streaming to YouTube or Facebook or other things, you're at thirty frames a second or sixty frames a second. Period. It doesn't matter whether you're in some other country. It doesn't matter whether you're shooting uh, film. You are, it is going to be 30 frames or 60 frames, 60 frames for games. And you can turn it up that way or 30 frames, but it's not going to be something else. And, and so, and what happens is a lot, we have filmmakers that do this all the time. They want to stream something and they shoot at 24 frames a second because that's their look. And then what we have to do is this horrible pull up to the, to the 30 that is just, you know, it just looks very, it looks more framey than 24 already looks. And because that's the way they want to shoot it. And so you have to, and, and a lot of times we have to talk about what are people prioritizing? Is it the post-production at 24 or is it going to be at 30? And you have to remember that probably 80% of the population is watching your footage at 60 frames a second of some, you know, of some like, 80, you know, in, in America, 60, 90, 80 to 90% of people are not changing their TV to 24. They are watching it and it's getting, it's getting converted uh, to whatever's there. And so you, if you're building something for film, that makes sense. If you're building something for that TV distribution, maybe, <laughs> maybe that, maybe that makes sense. Um, I, I don't, I do think that, uh, we're going to see higher and higher frame rates going out. I don't think it necessarily will convert to film. I think there's a bunch of inertia that's in, in Hollywood around 24. Like if you talk about frame rate in Hollywood, you're not talking about 24 versus 30 or versus 60. There's just big arguments about 2398 versus 24. <laughs> like that's the only, that's that's as far, they're not, the, the other things they're not even considering. And so you're going to keep on getting these 24 frame uh, things. But what where we do see it making a difference is when we start looking at uh, at live. So, Live really wants as many frames as you can throw at it. So concerts, uh, sports, and the only one that we have seen it to be really compelling for higher frame rates from a movie. So I, again, I, I'm behind the movies. I, I will say that, so I, I'm not, a, I don't think movies should be shot over 96 frames a second because I think that there's a problem with um, people getting sick. Um, so I don't think that high frame rate. I will say that I feel... When, if you went to see Avatar, so Avatar was projecting for most people at 40 frame, 48 frames a second. And then they were just doubling frames to get to the 24 when they were above the water, mostly. And then when they went below water, you saw 48. I felt like that was the biggest sell of higher frame rate I've ever seen. Uh, when they went under, anybody who's watched Avatar, when they went underwater, I just thought it was a beautiful experience, you know, that was under there. And when they came back up, it just felt like a, the comparison of having those two frame rates in the same movie showed for me showed what is wrong with 24 <laughs> like, because i was underneath i was like i want to see the whole movie like this and we came back up and all and, and the 24 just you could see the frames and that's the problem for us who do high frame rate work we can just see all the frames in 24 and it's just it, it it's painful sky you had a last comment before we yeah, move on to three, everybody's questions three movies uh that you might want to observe uh pacific rim uh, it is a higher frame rate and uh, the movie 300 was shot at a higher frame rate. Again, artistically was a choice. And then there was a Lord of the Rings movie that was projected at, at early days. That was one of the early 48 frames. And that gives you a different texture. And so what you're what used to is all of that frame blur that you don't get with more frames. All right. It's been a good discussion. It's time to bring the audience in on it. So first question. Uh, next, the first question uh, for the for this hour is from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana, and Roscoe asks: Are humans sensitive to certain frame rates due to the being raised on a specific TV system? Courtney, what do you think? Yes, I think so. I think the first time I went to Europe and saw twenty five frame video, I couldn't get over the flicker that I was seeing, you know, because it was. Um, I don't think it was interlaced at the time. So you'd see the 24 fl frame flicker on a CRT. These are on CRTs. This is not near as big a problem as it is today because LCDs don't flicker 
uh, the LCD panels that we have in most of our televisions these days uh, don't refresh, uh, aren't scanned a line at a time by an electron beam to go from top to bottom. So we don't see the flicker as much uh, in an LCD TV as you do in a CRT TV, especially if you got to one that was like, you know, 60 inches big. Uh, so you are sensitive to it in different TV systems uh, once you become acclimatized to it. But, but nowadays, not so much because the LCDs smooth out uh, you know, your persistence of vision based on 50 or 60 hertz. Sky, you had a thought? In high school, I was a projectionist and I put the film in the, the machine and watched the, the, you know, the reels go across and I had to change reels and everything. But I was told maybe 10 years ago by a friend who was a part of the Dolby uh, company that in China, they were putting in hundreds of theaters and all of them were at 60 frames. A second because they were now in uh, digital projection consequently uh, the people are used to there now the, a higher frame rate so there's a uh, i don't know about the sensitivity but the ability of what technology is able to to go to do and then what we are used to consuming alex you had a thought yeah, I do think that there's a, there's a generational thing that's starting to happen where a lot of gamers, a lot of folks that are watching things are used to looking at things at very high frame rate. And again, when you watch a lot of high frame rate, you have a hard time going back to lower frame rates. And so I think that you're going to see more and more. And, and I think that you'll probably see over the reason one of the reasons it's important for us to talk about this is that in the next two years, you're probably going to see um, a lot more uh, high frame rate uh, delivery. And so that's that's something everyone's working on. All the TVs are already 120 frames a second. A growing number of cameras can do 120 frames a second. Uh, the, your iPhone can do 120 frames a second. Um, the So there's, you know, like the Apple TV, the last one that was sold, can do 120 frames a second at 4K. It, that's the standard that it's built on. It's just not using it. So it's got it, literally Apple selling all of this stuff into something that they could flick a switch at any moment and be, you can now shoot your home videos with your iPhone at 120 frames a second and watch it at home on your big TV. And as soon as that happens, people are gonna get used to watching lots and lots of stuff at 120 frames a second. And it's going to make a lot of other things feel very antiquated, um, you know, in that, it, it, you know, by comparison, because they're just gonna get used to that, that, that feel that they have there. And um, so I think that you're gonna see, you know, this kind of movement. Also, some of the things that have been hard have been, getting 120 frames a second to go through the standard copper pipelines, you know, so SDI and so on and so forth. We can do it, but it's super painful to do high, high, and a lot of that's going to get changed with 2110. And so, um, and I think that over the next two years, 2110, we've talked about for a long time. It's kind of, as we said yesterday, it's a, it's kind of the grown up version of NDI, <laughs> you know, and so, uh, and it's been very long in the, you know, a slow, uh, uh, a slow push forward but I have a feeling that we're gonna see a lot of it over the next two years. And so you're gonna, you, you, it's gonna start breaking out and you're gonna see a lot more of it. And that's gonna allow us to be much more flexible with our frame rates as well. Uh, Courtney, you had a last thought? Yeah, it's important to make a distinction between the capture frame rate and the display frame rate because a lot of times they don't match. Uh, and the difference is the capture frame rate really determines whether or not you're gonna feel, what you're gonna feel when you, when you look at it played back, regardless of the display frame rate. For example, if you're looking at a stop motion animated film where nothing is actually moving during the frame while the camera frame shutter is open, uh, it has a completely different look than it does if you're shooting a live action film where there's motion blur because the while the camera shutter is open, the objects are moving. In fact, uh, Phil Tippett came up with this go motion uh, stop frame animation that he used on a lot of a few of those dinosaur movies before everything went to CGI, which would actually uh, do like puppet animation of, of, of dinosaurs and things, but they would actually hold the frame open and they would have motors to actually move the model while the frame was open very slowly so that you would have that motion blur and it would look much more realistic uh, to the eye when played back at, at the playback frame rate. So the capture frame rate, which is determined by the shutter angle and the, um, and the frame rate uh, of the film or video that's running through there determines how your brain interprets things. And in Saving Private Ryan, another thing to mention that opening scene was shot with a very short shutter angle, which made a shorter uh, 
uh, exposure time for each frame. They were still shooting at 24 frames per second, but uh, since the shutter was only for a brief period of time, you didn't have very much motion blur, blur in each frame. And so you get this really surrealistic, uh, almost animated feel to the, the opening sequence there. It has much more uh, uh, impact, emotional impact on it. And that's why that opening scene carried so much emotional impact because of the short duration. And of course, the higher the frame rate, the less motion blur there is. And the more you move toward uh, reality, uh, uh, which Doug Trumbull did a lot of experimentation uh, about frame rate and perception. And he had determined that 60 frames, 70 millimeter film at 60 frames per second brought you into the feeling of reality. And uh, so that you stopped interpreting uh, a film as, as watching a film as more like looking out a window. And uh, his show scan, which he used in a lot of ride films and things that were at amusement parks, all ran at 60 frames per second. And he did a lot of research in that, in that area. Alex? Yeah, you'll find that a lot of folks that are trying to always push the outer envelope are all talking about frame rate. So whether it's, you know, there's, you know, whether it's the Lord of the Rings or, or James Cameron or Doug Trumbull, a lot of people are always experimenting because they want to get closer to you feeling it. Uh, the, the motion blur is really interesting to what Courtney said. It, they used a 90, 90 degree. So typically a 360 degree means it's open the whole time the frame is being captured. And so you get a much more blurry area. 180 degrees is what we're used to. So we're used to having that, that frame be open for 180 degrees at at uh, 90 degrees is what they use for Saving Prime Ryan. And the reason they did that, which is half the amount of motion blur that is in a normal one, is because that's what they did in for the World War II cameras. So the cameras that were carried around, that's what they had because they were more, it made them more robust. They made them less likely to catch. And so that they the, those were designed around that 90 frame, uh, that 90 degree um, piece there. And it, it definitely changes. And again, I think it's really important as we talk about this frame rate, is not it's not just frame rate it's frame rate it is and as bill said at the very beginning it's frame rate it's the shutter speed it's the you know all those things are impacting uh you know how we feel when we're looking at it and that's really what we're looking at here when we talk about frame rate is how people feel there's one more little thing we haven't touched on and that is the temporal um, uh, time that the shutter takes to open up and close and does it get that motion blur comes from the fact that the motion is happening in front of the camera faster than the duration of that shutter opening. In TV specifically, it's interlaced. It draws all the lines for the even fields, then all the lines from the odd fields. And uh, for those of us who were doing captures off of videotape back in the day, you do a still capsule and you see little jaggies along the edge, and that was the interlace artifacts. And so uh, most of the software is built so that it would take the even lines and double them get it would throw away all the odd lines and it would double the even lines so you get at least a clear temporal capture off of that uh, VHS or or digital analog kind of capture Alex you had another thought yeah and and that was it was interesting for a long time we tried to deinterlace things by using both frames so we tried to use both frames and even those out and so there was these deinterlacers that that did that and what happened is that the scaling technology got so much better that it was it was more effective to scale the image one field scale it up as opposed to uh then trying to integrate the two frames together so you got a cleaner edge and you got cleaner because we figured out the scaling technology got so much better so much faster than in interpolating between the two that you were able to just stretch it out and, and scale it up and it was going to be a much better solution there um the what's interesting is that most tv is still that you watch most tv that's shot that that comes to you is in 1080i it's in still an in interlace and the reason that all these frame rates are now becoming a big deal and because they're accelerating is because we're moving away from broadcast. Broadcast doesn't have the money to, it's very expensive for them to go from 1080i to 1080p. And you start talking to broadcasters and you're like, well, uh, there's nothing we can do with 1080p. <laughs> like, like there's like, there, there, there's billions of dollars that need to be spent for a network to, to change its format. Uh, and it was probably a little short-sighted to, to go to 1080i when they were doing the regearing in the late aughts. Uh, but, uh, but now that we're in, but the problem is you have people's TVs couldn't do it. And there was all these other things that happened but what's happening with frame rate is really because we have the YouTubes, we have the streamers, we have all these other things that changing the frame rate is just changing the description, you know, just changing the frames. Like you don't have to worry about a whole subsystem that's going to support that. All right, let's go on to the next question. Next question is from Sky Gleason and Sky asks, Bill, I was taught that the persistence of illusion to cost is why we have 24 frames per second. Is that true? 
Well, kind of. The term is really, I think, persistion of persistence of vision, and that leads to the illusion of consistent action. So, uh, yeah, in, in my reading, when they move from the 16 frames per second of the silent film era to 24, the part of that was they were looking for the most efficient, therefore the cheapest way, to get this persistence of vision to create the illusion of smooth movement. And frames were expensive. When you were rolling film through a camera and doing, you know, even medium shots, it was really, let's get this done. We don't want to waste a lot of time and money processing more film than we have to. So, yeah, cost was always a factor in well, this. Well, wasn't there uh, silver silver oxide in the chemical or something? Silver nitrate. Nitrate. Yeah, so it, it was... used to be, yeah, the, the original film stock was expensive. It was complicated. It required expensive chemicals to develop, and that was environmentally really a mess because that stuff is pretty nasty, I understand. So yeah, it was all part of the stew of coming up with a film rate that was efficient that everybody could agree on so you can only do it once and it would be good for everybody not have to print film for all those different systems. Let's go on to the next question. The next question is from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. And Roscoe asks, in the early days of moving images, frame rates were kept low due to the cost of film. Are there any other any reasons to keep frame rates lower in a modern era? Alex, you want to weigh in? It still costs. <laughs> so, so, so frame rate, even though we, you know, it, it, it's 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 cheaper now than it ever has been. But there are a bunch of reasons that frame rate becomes more complicated. So, the old MacBreak videos that came out in two thousand five were actually shot at 2398, not because I believed in 2398 and I thought that was the right thing, but because I had to pay for the bandwidth and it saved me one sixth. <laughs> you know, like I just shaved off a little bit of the, the file size by, by making it 24 frames a second. And it was funny when I did it, someone pointed out, well, that's exactly why they did it in the first place, you know, <laughs> to save a little bit of money. So, uh, so that, that is, and what happens is, is that our subsystems, everything gets more expensive as you start adding frame rates. So if you start adding, if you go to 60 frames a second, especially let's say at 4K, so a 4K 60 frames a second or 12G connection, uh, the, the problem is, is that that is very hard. To, it's hard to run the signal for a long distance. It's hard, it takes up a lot of storage. It takes up a lot of, so as you start to increase these frame rates, especially as they relate to, uh, to those things, you, you start to get into a situation where it is, everything's more expensive. Everything's a little harder. Everything's a little bit tweakier um, of what it, what it needs to do to make that happen. So when you start, and I've done some stuff at 8K120, and you, I mean, it is, you turn it on and it feels almost like a film mag because you're pulling so much data off the camera that you are, you know, you can get maybe 20 minutes on there, a little bit more than the film mag of seven minutes or whatever, but it's like, you're pulling off and that's a terabyte of, of information. Just like, whoop, and I've got that whole terabyte that's that's there at, at a really high frame rate and high resolution. Um, so, so it can get very, very expensive to start doing this and the subsystems, every subsystem has to support it. So as you go into those higher frame rates, we have trouble with that. And, and again, when you talk about streamers, streaming you at 24 frames a second, it's one of the reasons I was talking to someone like, why don't we stream at higher frame rate? And cost did come up still after all these years, cost came up that it would cost Netflix more money or, or Apple or everybody else. They're, you're paying a subscription. They don't make more money by you downloading when you download more movies. And so, you know, going to a higher frame rate means they're paying more uh, for something that they're not getting paid for. So it still, still comes down to cost at very high frame rates. The old idea, the newer idea is that the that that persistent that thing where you start to feel like it's a, a vision of reality is most of us think it's between, about around ninety six frames a second. Is the that it, going up to the one twenty? Um, there are a whole bunch of things. So once you go over ninety six frames a second, there's a whole bunch of other reasons not to do that, and that's you have to change the way you do filmmaking. So as you start to do that, to have people comfortable, you can't use jibs, you can't use planes, you can't use big camera moves. You can't do, there's a whole lot of things that you have to, not, you can't, but you can't do very many of them before people will literally get up and walk out. You know, like they will literally, we've, <clears throat> we've had this issue where people get so disoriented and so sick that they will get up out of the theater and just leave because they can't deal with, um, they saw that a little bit in Gemini Man, which they shot at 120. Um, but there's been other tests that we've done where people have just gotten out of the theater, if it, especially if it fills their whole frame of reference. They don't have any, the, if you're close enough to the screen, like a really big screen, or you're close enough to it, and you don't have a frame of reference, um, you can get really disoriented if you with big camera moves. Courtney. 
Yeah, they, uh, it was not only the cost of the film, but it had to do with packaging, too. you got to realize that uh, longer films were, you know, there were reels of certain size. You couldn't get a reel, you know, to accommodate a, a three-hour movie in one piece of film. Would You'd have to have a reel that was, you know, five feet wide, and no one could lift it to put it on the projector. So those those considerations had to take it, were taken into account. First movies were one-reelers or two reelers. So a certain length of time, you're limited in time, not only because of the frame rate, but because of the length of the film determined how they could package it, ship it and project it. Uh, and these days that's translated into digital film. That's, uh, you know, packaging it into, first of all, analog videotape. You know, there was so much bandwidth you could allow to fit so many, so much time on a video cassette. And that's what, you know, determine the beta versus VHS wars and who won there was the amount of playing time that you could fit into a single cassette. So those considerations is the resolution, the frame rate, and uh, the number of frames per second than the uh, resolution of each image. And remember when you double the width of an image as far as resolution, the number of pixels horizontally, you're doubling the bandwidth times four because you got the horizontal and vertical to maintain that aspect ratio. So you're now using four times the amount of data per frame than you were at the next lower uh, uh, resolution. So uh, bandwidth is very expensive, and uh, that's our container these days, is the bandwidth that we have to fit these images into for broadcast or for transmission uh, or transmitting data or putting onto a thumb drive or hard drive. You know, that all makes a difference. It all stacks up. People, I, I had a lot of cinematographers say, well, why don't I just shoot at 60? Because hard drives are cheap these days. Well, yeah, but you can only transfer that data at a certain rate. They don't take into account how much time through the entire post-production business it, you're going to transfer that four times that amount of data through the pipeline. It's going to take you four times as long to transfer it through your pipeline. So although that hard drive is cheap, your time isn't, and your time is the most expensive component of post-production. Sky? In film, I was taught that if you don't have your negative or your original footage in three locations, you don't have your film. So Alex, when you said 120 frames a second at 4K, at RAW, I'm just thinking of all the hard drives that I'd have to be managing. I, I, my brain just kind of popped. Alex? Yeah, one thing that that is a key to what Courtney said also is that how important it is to have even divisible frame rates. So when you go from 24 to 60, uh, you know, if you try to up convert that to, from 24 to 60, you're just making up a bunch of frames and they're not evenly div divided because you, there's no way to get there. Uh, and so 30 to 60 is a lot easier. 60 to 30 is a lot easier. 60 to 24 doesn't do it very well. And so all of those things that you have to think about too. And that's why a lot of us think are thinking about 120. It's not quite there yet, but we keep on thinking about 120. Now you wouldn't have as much light, but it's not, it's not over. Uh, it's not the only reason to, to do that. But we think that a lot of people are going to start thinking about shooting at 120 because we can deliver in a lot of different formats. Um, and we can do that natively without having to make up frames to do that. And don't forget, there's one other aspect, which is that even if you think you can shoot forever because the storage is cheap or you're on long tapes or whatever, every time you leave a camera running as opposed to executing shots because it starts there and it ends there, that's something you're going to have to review and post. You're going to have to go through and filter out all the bad junk. And that's a large crew of people sometimes working on the back end. So to be, a, you know, it's this balance always between being efficient, shooting what you need to shoot. And yet not overshooting so that you have, you're just clogging up the back end with a lot of useless information that'll never be a candidate for making it into your final work. Alex, you had a little thought? Yeah, and to build on that a little bit is that you just, in all filmmaking or all media creation, you want to look at what are the limitations of the system that you're using and how are they affecting your creativity? Because a lot of times you'll find that subtly things that are a, a little too much hard drive, this isn't quite right, this isn't whatever, is is basically putting weight on you being creative because you have to live inside of something that is possibly artificial, like does it matter? And you always have to, to, to test that. And, and when you start making decisions because you don't have enough hard drive space, which we do all the time, uh, then it's, it's, it's affecting your show. And so you want to think about whether frame rate's going to benefit you enough to do that. 
Let's move on to the next question. Next question is from Jesse Mills. And Jesse uh, asks, uh, please explain why shutter speed is set at half the frame rate as the starting point. Alex, you want to start us off? My understanding is mostly that it, that people decided it looked natural. <laughs> like it looked, that was the, when you opened it up to 360, it looked like it was more motion blur than we were expecting. When it, when it was down to 90, it was, it was a, uh, it didn't look as, uh, it looked too stuttery. Uh, but in, in 180, it was kind of decided that was, and we talk about it in 180 so that it's simpler because it's always half of the frame rate as opposed to saying, uh, you know, I'm going to do a 48 frame shutter with a, you know, which you can do, by the way. You can change your shutter speeds uh, in digital cameras to be something different, but it used to be a mechanical. So you had to make a decision about what it was, what that's actually going to do. Courtney? Yeah, it was originally based on pull down because, you know, film is an intermittent, it's a series of still images. And so it shoots one still while the shutter is open, the shutter closes. Then that film has to be pulled down while the shutter is closed. So 50% of the time, that uh, shutter has to be closed in order for the me mechanism in the film camera to pull the film down to get the next frame locked into position before that shutter opens again. Otherwise, you get vertical smear because the film would be moving while that shutter is open. So that's originally why uh, shutter speed was set to, uh, shutter angle was set to 180 degrees or half, 1 48th of a second, which is your shutter speed. Uh, on a motion picture camera, you could shorten it some so that you could expose the shutter would go by. And so you'd have a larger period of time where the shutter is closed. So your pull down would happen and sit in black for a period of time. And then the shutter would open, but you can't, uh, it was harder to go for a, a wider open shutter speed because of the mechanic mechanics of how fast that pull down can happen has to happen in a short period of time. So you should, couldn't go to a 360 degree shutter in film you can electronically, as long as you don't have to deal with, uh, now that we're in full digital, in the analog, you have analog, original analog video it has a retrace time. In other words, the electron beam would scan from the top to the bottom, and then it'd have to turn off when it moved back to the top of the, the next frame to start scanning the next frame or the next field. That's called retrace time, where it was turned off. So that's the equivalent of... Uh, shutter speed in video. But now that we've gone digital, uh, frames can capture full frame at the same time. So all the little pixels can be captured at the same moment in time, or they can be scanned from top to bottom, depending upon the, whether it's a global shutter or a scanned shutter. And those that's things rough. have to be, that's another that's can another of worms. Second hour. That's another second. Second. Really yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> this can go forever. In fact, I think that's why the 5D Mark II became such a giant still camera doing video because they were the first ones that had that digit processor that could dump the frame buffer of an entire raster out fast enough to get the next one in the right amount of time so the still camera could do video properly. It was an amazing. Properly is a big word. Alex, do you have another thought? Yeah, <laughs> properly is. For the, for the Mark II. As someone, I, I used to own three of them. We used to shoot all the time. Properly is a is a big word for the Mark II. Like it was not. It, it, well, it was did the it. best for the time. <laughs> it didn't do it very well. Um, yeah, the, uh, you, um, no, I forget what I was going to say. Let's, we can just move on. Yeah, okay. Let's go to the next question. Next question is from Eduardo Augustine in Panama. And, and Eduardo asks, how does frame rate affect during editing more processing power from 24 to 30 to 60? Uh, Alex, you want to start us off? The answer is yes. <laughs> it takes more. It takes more to do that. You, you, you know, so it's definitely going to affect that. You also have to make sure this is where we talk about standardization. You have to figure out if everyone's going to give you the, the biggest problem we have is that we're going to do something at 30 or 60 and then people start delivering things at 24 and then people want to do, you know, and, and so there's uh, getting all those frame rates together is the thing that is probably the biggest part of editing is, is people not sending frame rates in at the same time. And a lot of times like there are, again, if we're streaming to let's say YouTube, we're saying, well, we're on a 30 base because it's going to go to YouTube at 30 base. I don't want their conversion to do that. But then I, then you deal with people who are filmmakers or people who are corporate that wish they were filmmakers and they just insist on sending you 24 because that's the way it has to be. And you're kind of like, okay, <laughs> like, like, you know, like now I have to do all this frame rate conversion as well. Uh, and so um, I do admit that I, I work at, I work at what my display, my display frame rate is and I work backwards and drive everything through it so that I have at least an evenly divisible frame rate that's going to go into that as opposed to having to, you know, re, you know, 
improperly rebuild frames. Uh, Sky. Uh, Alex, when you say display frame rate, you mean your physical display or how you're delivering it to the how projector? I'm delivering it. Like the yeah, delivery frame delivering rate it. for me drives the capture. Like there you can you do it differently. Courtney astutely uh, pointed out you can do it differently. I don't. Like if I'm going to display it at a certain frame rate, I'm going to shoot it at the same frame rate I want to see it at. And that, that'll be the cleanest. But if you wanted to do a slow motion something, you would do a higher frame rate. But Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're... That's slow motion. That's another second hour. <laughs> there we go. But uh, initially, the horsepower, we just didn't have the hardware. And so to Alex's workflow, originally, I, I understand you would flatten everything to a frame rate. You would convert everything before you would, and even to a codec, before you would put it into your syst- your nonlinear editing system. Still do. And still do, yeah. even though we have the, 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 the M2, you know, hardware, horse, horsepower to, to manage it. So again, a lot of these old shibboleths are being changed and the, the nonlinear editing systems can just handle it or can they? Well, it's, it, 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 it's a, it's complicated. It is better. I will say that from someone who used to work in the days when you had 15 frame per second, uh, terrible small raster stuff was the only thing cameras could deliver to us. It's gotten a lot better since then. Courtney, you had thoughts. It all relates, once once we went to digital, it all relates to bandwidth, is how fast can that memory store the data that's coming out of the camera, and how fast can we transmit it to the display to get a frame uh, in a 24th of a second. And the problem is, uh, as we got higher and higher resolution, that requires more and more bandwidth, because the frame rate is staying the same, but the more dots per frame means a lot more bandwidth is required. That's where we got into compression. And so that's why all the different, you know, we shoot in, you hear the term raw, you know, uh, red raw, uh, uh, which is all the frames are consistent and non-compressed or they're compressed within each frame and they're not long geo, not long GOP compression, not groups of pictures that are compressed. And that's a whole nother third hour, but, uh, but uh, the compression (laughs) is now used to, uh, to, to compensate for the reduced, for the uh, limited amount of bandwidth that is available for all these memory products and display products that are out there. So we have to go to compression because it can't handle the full bandwidth of transmitting the the accurate values for every single pixel one at a time over that little pipe and still get it to to the screen or to the sensor in time. Sky, you had a last thought? Yeah, and I, I was in the era of when we converted from delivering tapes as our product to d- digital files. And when ABC said, yes, we now accept and require you to give us ProRes files, that flattened the earth in a lot of ways. Let's move on to the next question. Our next question is from Paul Buchan in Columbus, Ohio. And Paul asks, how do you best explain the differences between P, PSF, and I, and the compatibility of issues that arise with them? Okay, Alex, you want to dive into this? Yeah, so P is typically progressive. That means you're getting a whole frame. Every time, if it's 24, if it's 30, it's 60, 120, if it's P, a progressive, it's going to be whole frames. Uh, I is interlace. And so what it says, and, and, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, is that I'm going to give you half the frame. This interlace made it easier to manage the bandwidth, and I'm going to give you half the frame, and then I'm going to give you the next half of that frame. And they're going to be, but they're two halves, and they're interlaced every other every other line. Um, and so you 30i or, or 60i or 59 and 4i, whatever, is going to be these, it's actually two fields that are going back and forth. And this was to create more frame rate, the appearance of more frame rate without creating more actual um, data. And so that, so by 30 frame per second, 30i was giving you 60 frames a second <laughs> that were, that were frames. It's just that they were, they were every other and it gave you the appearance of that higher motion, which TV liked and um, the Japanese manufacturers are really attached to. PSF was this issue, um, the store, as the story goes, um, the uh, PSF is that uh, Sony was showing uh, Lucasfilm what uh, the, I think the 700s, the, the, their HD cameras. And Lucasfilm was like, well, you, this is great, but w- c- where's the 24P? <laughs> like, like where's, we're, a film, we're a film company, where's the 24P? And they were like, why would you need that? And they said, well, if we, if we have it, we would shoot Star Wars with it. And so then there became this engineering challenge of how to get a, a interlaced signal to 
represent 24 frames per second. And so the PSF is this, this way to get interlace to move all the way through in pipeline that it has interlace, but have that built into it so that it can pull it back. And so both ends have to know how to negotiate that. So the, um, the, the, what's writing it and what's putting it out needs, needs to know how that frame order went and it pulls it back together much in a pull, like a pull up, pull down kind of a relationship. It pulls it back together into 24 frames. So when you record it, when we record something that, and we were able to manage it with PSF, what we would get out of it, uh, we did this a lot with our Sony, the, this camera over here. No, no, over here. This camera here, that's I think the first camera that did that. Um, and that camera, that's the F950 and it, uh, it would, uh, output that, but when you recorded it, you just get 24 frames a second. As long as the as long as the interface knew that it was coming in, it would just recompile it on the way through. Let's go to the next question. Next question is from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana, and Roscoe asks, "What is the relationship of shutter speed to frame rate, and when should you use more or less blur?" Sky, how much clarity do you want your audience to perceive? Maybe you want a soft. Uh, image and consequently maybe you want just the one thing that's in focus you know to be the eyes and you something's blurry in the background uh i again back to alex's point of saving private ryan there is a youtube video out there that talks about also the concept the difference between shutter speed and t-stop which is kind of that's i'll let courtney explain that one again but the reality of the dirt you know being be so accurate, so articulate, it made made you feel like you were on the battlefield in that uh, Saving Private Ryan experience. And so that's uh, how much do you want your audience to feel that they're in the moment? Is my understanding, Courtney? Yeah, it has it has to do with the perception of reality. Uh, we call it soap opera effect when the you know when you have your TV interpolates and adds frames. Uh, to 24 frame video to make it smoother. You, you have less temporal artifacts, less motion blur uh, between each frame and you interpret it more as reality and shutter speed determines the amount of exposure time per each frame or how much motion blur there is during each frame during capture. And uh, Ang Lee did a film called Billy Lynn's Long Half Time Walk, which was an experimentation that was shot uh, in... Uh, uh, 4K uh, 60, I think, frames 60 or 120, 120 frames per second. And it was projected at that at in one or two places. And I happened to see one, the one place at the Centerama Dome where they projected it uh, at its full frame rate. And it was amazing, but it was kind of like watching a stage play. You know, it took, it was like watching a stage play through binoculars. So you had these different close-ups and stuff, uh, different camera angles, but the action, there was no motion blur. So it was kind of like you're watching a stage play. So it had a completely different field and it hasn't been uh, reproduced since then. That was back in 2017 or something, or before that, 2014, 2017. And we're talking a lot about the technology of it. There's also another thing uh, about shutter speed and frame rate and that's the light gathering capabilities when you start increasing your shutter speed and you increase the frame rate the film or the digital sensor has less time to gather light so you tend to have to open up exposure do something open aperture do something to get more light to hit that film or sensor to achieve the exposure you're looking for. So as you move up into frame rates and exposure and things like that, you really have to adjust other things. These optical systems are interrelated. So you can't just change one thing, like crank up your shutter speed and not expect that to have an effect on how you manage the exposure so you get a decent image out of your camera and it doesn't look too dark and murky. So there's an aesthetic side to this as well. Let's go to the next question. Next question is from Eduardo Augustine in Panama. And Eduardo asks, uh, should we always push to 60 frames per second in our production, uh, streaming sports, podcasts, talk shows, Zoom, et cetera? John Prado. I have a tangential thought on this, on this regard. I wonder how our kids are affected with watching these high frame rate games that they play for 12, 14 hours at a time. They're 
my son plays at 144 frames per second. They go all the way up to 240 frames per second after years and years. I wonder what that's doing to their neural networks. That's a good question, Alex. You yeah, thoughts? I don't know if it, I, I think that most of life is is at a higher frame rate, and so I think that it's it's it, you know I think that they're um, probably pretty used to it. I do think the fast twitch is going to be very different for them from games. As far as these go, you know, one thing to always think about is good. You know, number one is look at what you're trying to do. If you're doing a film and you're working with a filmmaker, don't start talking about 60 frames a second. Just do 24 and call it a day. If you if you have got you know, I think that 48 is really interesting for film. I think that it's it's a good compromise as far as getting a higher frame rate, but that's going to be, you know, I, I don't try to create drama there. If I'm working with a filmmaker, I just assume I'm working at 24. Um, when it, the things that I think make a difference at 60 and at, at 120 are things that are live things that are. So if you're doing live sports concerts, um, again, horror <laughs> is one thing that, that does really well at high frame rate, uh, it, because it makes it much more visceral things that you want to feel like they're more visceral the frame rate makes a difference. Um, other, other things they may they may, may not make as much. And also look at the format that you're putting it out at. So whether, you know, are you putting it out to YouTube or Facebook? And the other thing to think about is your bandwidth. So you want to think about good frames, not just the number of frames, but how many good ones can you have? If you've got 10 megs a second to do something, running at a higher frame rate is using up, you're not going to get as many good frames out of it. So you may choose a, a lower frame rate to fit into that cap. All right. Well, let's try to get through one more here before we finish up for the day. I think we can probably finish these. I mean, this is the second hour. We can't come back to it. So uh, next question okay. is from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. And Roscoe uh, asks, uh, what is your go-to audio app to speed up or slow down audio if you must match audio samples uh, to a changing frame rate? Alex. Most of the editing tools will do that on their own now. <laughs> so, so I think that Final Cut, Bill, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if you change the frame rate, it'll change, it'll keep the um, the audio where it should be as far as a tone tonal. And I think Premiere does that, uh, Resolve does that. So it's, it's yeah, most common. of the NLEs will do. I would just let yeah. them do it at this well, point. Yeah, and it actually is amazingly good. You can run things. I, I all the time are using the. Uh, fast forward keys and the audio doesn't change even in two and four times fast eventually get to the point where it can't keep up with the audio reprocessing but they're pretty amazing let's go to the next question next question is from peter belbin in houston texas and peter asks u.s broadcast tv has typically been interlaced fields at 5994 rather than progressive complete frames uh, aren't they due to bandwidth being insufficient to provide the detail needed uh, for progressive frames Alex? At this point, it's mostly just because they've got a lot of infrastructure that does interlace and they couldn't, you know, nothing will see it. So, you know, if you have an interlace only and you start throwing progressive, it just, it, bandwidth technically is correct, but generally they just, they would have to replace all their hardware through all the networks and the TV shows to TV networks and TV stations to get 1080p. And that would be billions and billions, potentially, you know, low, low trillions of dollars for them to do. And the next and final question. Uh, last question is from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. And Roscoe asks, frame rate versus resolution versus dynamic range, which property of the moving image is the most important to the audience? It's Sky Gleason. I think, I, that's a directorial conversation. I, what's most important to the audience is the engagement. Is it interesting or is it entertaining? Now, I love seeing Courtney's, you know, Emmy back there because he's got a nice crisp image. Alex, on the other hand, has a shallow depth of field. So it's all kind of blurry. Bill, you're, you're kind of like, like Red Riding Hood. You're somewhere right in the middle. You're just right. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate that. Alex? What we find is order of importance tends to be dynamic range, then frame rate, then resolution as far as how people experience it. So we put up with a lot of exper a, a lot of resolution being a little bit like once you get to 1080p, more than that makes it better. But the dynamic range and the frame rate will impact the viewer more. All right. This was an extraordinary uh, discussion. Thank you, everybody, for participating in it. Uh, first and foremost, all of our panelists who brought the expertise to the first hour questions and this discussion of frame rates. We really hope that this was informative for you, a lot of you. Thank you all who were watching for entering your questions. As always, this show doesn't happen unless you provide our questions and you did another magnificent job of that. So thank you to everybody who's watching. And I can't 
finish up without saying a huge thank you to the back end crew, the small legion of people who are behind the scenes pushing buttons and checking computers all over the world, really. Uh, putting themselves together in this Office Hours family to bring this to you every day. We appreciate you tremendously as well. We'll be back tomorrow with another show. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on Friday morning. Bye. I just want to shoot everything at 120 frames a second. 120, definitely, definitely 120. 4K, 120. So 8K, much data. 8K, 120. 8K. 4K raw. Kill's frame rate will always remain a mystery. So much data, so little time. Cut to the edit, shoot to the edit, my favorite phrase. Because I have to sit through all of the stuff that you shoot that you'll never use. Unless you're paying me by the hour. Shoot all you want in that case. Somebody's got to look at it.